Now we're going to be in Romans chapter 2 in the ESV version. And we'll see what the Lord has to say. So while she's getting all that together, last week we um, we covered, well not last week, John preached on the last week, praise God. Um, the week before, we talked about Romans chapter 1. And just some basic things in Romans 1. Some things that were, that were introduced is the fact of conscience and creation. The fact that God has created man with a conscience and that because of that, man is aware that God exists. And in addition, because of creation, man is aware that God exists. So I've got to tell you that based upon the, the testimony of the Bible, if a man tells you that he doesn't believe in God, he's not telling you the truth. God has made himself real to him. But he's chosen, his heart instead has become, has hardened itself towards the things of God. And, um, and so that was one of the main, and, and when we were in Romans 1, the things were focused mostly on the Gentile. Um, so the chapter 1 was focused on Gentiles, right? Or how, how nowadays, you know what, the word pagan is used a lot. Pagan has taken on a whole new life. Again, it's coming back into the into the mainstream talk about, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all heard talk to somebody, hey, which religion are you? I'm pagan. Well, what does that mean? Well, it really means that they're practicing witchcraft. But but the point is, is that in the Old Testament, pagans and heathens and Gentiles were actually all the nations that were in Israel. So you got to understand that because it's important because God had revealed himself to the nation of Israel through Abraham. And that through Abraham came a nation that knew God and was supposed to serve God. Amen. And all the other nations were Gentiles and all the other nations were under the leadership, if you will, in the spirit realm. We don't have time to break it down and to prove it to you, but under the leadership of fallen angels. And that their, their, that their understanding of the origins of the earth, their understanding of the flood of the earth, their understanding of all these things was perverted under because of the lies that they that spiritually they were under. And whereas the children of Israel were told the truth. Okay, but last week or the last time I preached in Romans 1, it focused really mostly on the Gentile world that didn't know God. And I don't want to belabor the point too much, but it, it, Paul said this. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them which believe, to the Jew first, but also unto the Gentile. I got to tell you that you can't be ashamed of Jesus and you can't be ashamed of the gospel, which means good news. If you're expecting the Lord to receive you, amen, you're going to have to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. Praise God. Jesus died. But this is what happens. The scripture says this in chapter one, that because men suppress the truth. So in other words, whenever humanity hears the truth, they suppress the truth because the truth reveals to their heart what's really in them. And a lot of times we don't like the way that makes us feel. And so when we hear it, many times we suppress it. And as men suppress the truth, what ends up happening is that there's a spiraling downward of morality. And we talked about that the last time. And ultimately, where this ends up is, is that man leaves the natural use of a woman. And, and, and now men lie with men and women leave the natural use of a woman. A, a man and, and women lie with women. And, and, you know, so some people would say, well, you're not supposed to talk that way anymore. Well, no, that's what the word of God says. And, and I do want to say this. Listen, I'll preach as, as hard on homosexuality, though, but I, I will also preach on fornication, adultery. I will also preach on pornography. I will also preach on various other types of lust and you know, alcoholism and just cheating and stealing and lying because the word of God speaks on all of these things. There is a difference in a sense, though, when we're talking about homosexuality and transgenderism. Just work with me here in the book in creation. What are we told? God's God created everything with seed within itself to what to reproduce after its own kind. And what we see in homosexuality and transgenderism is an actual affront against the very creation work of God. So it is it is a little bit different in that sense. And that's why I believe that the word of God said so whenever man suppresses the truth. Listen, we have to be careful about this, that ultimately God will end up 
giving man what it is that he believes he wants in his heart. As a matter of fact, that's proven out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when it talks about the man of sin. You do understand that the world, that the scripture teaches that one day there's going to be a man of sin that rises up. And the scripture says that he's going to perform miracles and signs and wonders. And that he's going to deceive the multitude. And, and it actually says that God is allowing this. And then, you know, the first time I studied it, I was like, Lord, why would you allow this? He explains it right there. Second Thessalonians 2. Because they chose to believe a lie instead of the truth, God gave them what it was that they wanted. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not wanting that. I want to be close to the Lord. And listen, I'm just going to be real with you tonight. I, we'll see how this works. I was hoping to go through the whole chapter. But I want you to know that I've been in some places where I ought not been before Christ and even after Christ. I'm just going to be a real guy with you, yeah. brothers and sisters, tonight. And I need you to know that the love of the Father is proven in the cross of His Son. Amen. Uh, you know, it, it, that's how much he loves you and I. Amen. Now, we can get confused and start thinking it's all about us. But if we're not realizing his love for us is manifest in his love for his son and the fact that he put his son through that for you, that's how you get a revelation of his love for you. Amen. And so, so with that said, let's go ahead and let's read um, maybe the first few verses of Romans 2. And... Um, I will uh, read, yeah, we'll, we'll read the first three verses. This says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, who practice such things that judge people from the wrong perspective when they themselves have sin in their own hearts, right? It's a judgmental, self-righteous, hypocritical attitude, right? Do we understand that? He says, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now, listen, one thing that I don't want you to misunderstand is that I'm not saying that people are not supposed to be told the truth of the gospel. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is that we are, and, and we'll get into some scripture here in a moment, but that we need to make sure that our heart is staying soft before the Lord and that we're constantly being and re reminded of what he's done for us. Amen. And how he saved us before we you know, or as we continue to live our life. There's a lot of words uh, on, there's a lot of words that are in chapter two, and I'm not gonna write them all because I wouldn't have time to do that anyway. But the, one of the first words that stuck out to me was, um, was the word judgment. Because it talks a lot about judgment in chapter two. Nowadays, you know, they, we, we're hearing a lot of preaching that just, just refuses to talk about the judgment of God. And I got to tell you that that's not the real God. That, that's not the God of the Bible. There's, there's, there's going to be judgment. And there's not only going to be judgment for unbelievers. That's the white throne judgment. Okay. There's also going to be judgment for believers. And I'm not going to get into this in detail. But I just want you to say. I want you to know. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And it's whenever. So, so those that are going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. Are those that deny Jesus. That, de that deny uh, accepting his sacrifice. Where, where it says take me past the brazen altar. Into the holy place. And, and, and then place I was telling you on the mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled, just like it was sprinkled on the mercy seat beyond the veil in the Old Testament, has the blood been sprinkled, so to speak, on our hearts. Yes. And, and we have to come to the place where we've asked the Lord, Lord, I recognize I was, I'm, I'm a sinner and I need you, Lord. And, and those that refuse to accept that sacrifice for their sin will find themselves at the great white throne judgment. Okay, and it's eternal damnation. Jesus preached on hell. He said it's a place where the worm doesn't die, the fire isn't quenched, and that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People don't talk about that anymore, but Jesus talked about it. And, and, and that's a place that none of us want to go there, right? And so, but the other place is the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is where the works, are, uh, the works of believers are going to be judged. 
And, and listen, first of all, it's not just whether or not you told people or did you have a good day today or have a good day today. The judgment seat of Christ is connected to what, how we lived our life for the Lord, whether we surrendered to the Lord, how we serve the Lord, because, because there is a reward in serving the Lord. Now, listen, I got to tell you, you got to, we don't serve God to get the reward because really the reward is him and the reward goes back to him. That's why they cast their crowns at his feet. But I need you to understand that I believe, and I didn't plan on getting into this this much, but the parable of the talents. In the parable of the talents, it says he gave one talent to one, three to another, and five to another. The one buried his, the one with the three doubled his, and the one with the five doubled his. And then the landowner came back from his long journey to settle his accounts. That's like Jesus going to the Father's house. And he's left you and I with the opportunity to work and to serve him. And the question is, what are we going to do in this temporary life for Jesus, right? Are we going to live for the Lord? Are we going to serve the Lord? Or are we going to serve ourselves within this temporary life that we're living? Y'all understand this. This isn't just about getting our go to go to heaven free card, right? I mean, if this story is real, if you've read the Bible, that the Lord, the Lord served us by giving us his life. And the Lord is, the scripture is clear that he wants our life to be given unto him. Amen. And whenever we do that, he said this in the, in the parable. He said, you that turn three into six, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in small things. Now enter into your rest and be a ruler over many things. And he said that about the, the, the one with the five talents too that turned it into ten. So I just want to encourage you. What does it look like to serve? That's between you and the Holy Spirit, what that means. But it's got to have Jesus written all over it because he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Praise God. So that was the first word. I just wanted you to see that judgment. But look, here's another word, forbearance. That's a kind of a big word. But what does that word mean? It means patient, self-control, restraint, tolerance. Okay, so we got some people in here that, you know, there's probably a few guys that y'all are kind of like living together and some other people, some people got children in the house, right? And, you know, and, and some people married, right? And, and, and what we understand is, is that in relationships, sometimes we're having to have patience to tolerate people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I know you do. And, 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 but what we're talking about here in this forbearance is that God is patiently Tolerating some things. That's a good thing, but but look, if we don't, it, it, it turns into a bad thing, right? And then and then the word repentance. When we come to the realization how we need him, right? And we turn and we turn to him and we yield to him and we surrender. And we the Bible really in the Greek in the New Testament it describes changing your mind, but in the Old Testament it describes changing your direction. So it's a mixture of the two. My mind now is changed that I used to think that what I was doing was okay. Now I've come to the realization his word says something different. And by the grace of God, I'm making a 180 and I'm turning in another yes. direction. Yes. Amen? All right. The words Jew and Gentile are used. We've already kind of explained. Y'all know what a Jew is. We explained what a Gentile was earlier. The word law is, is used. Conscience. The, the word circumcised is used. The word uncircumcised is used. I didn't and the idea is that flesh is removed, flesh is removed, and blood is shed. In the New Testament scripture, it speaks of flesh as something that is, in, that is tainted by sin, and it required the blood of Jesus in order to cleanse us of our sin. And it's, as we follow the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, then what ends up happening is, is that there's a circumcision that's taking place to the inner man. And it's actually spoken of in Romans chapter 2. A circumcision that takes place on the inside of the, the inner man. Amen? But what, but what you need to understand is that in the Old Testament, the word, the circumcision described covenant with God. Yes. The, yes. the covenant with God. If you were going to be God's people, you, right. you, you were circumcised. There was an external covenant that was made. It started with Abraham, but it was the nation of Israel. Right? And, and what I'm needing you to understand is, is that so if you were circumcised, you were considered a Jew, at least in the text of the scripture. And if you were uncircumcised, you were considered a Gentile. 
And what it meant was that you weren't in covenant with God. All right? it, it, that's whenever, y'all remember the story of David and Goliath? David is just like an older, maybe an older teenage guy, and he goes over there to bring wine and cheese to his brothers because they're over there on the battlefield getting ready to fight the Philistines. And while he's there, Goliath stands up and says, well, when are you going to send one of your warriors to fight against me? And, and they're all kind of like shaking in their shoes like that, right? And all of a sudden, David says, what is going on here? What did, what did you say? Now, this is really, this, this is the Bible. David, David said, what did he say that he would give? I can't remember the number. I think it was 100. Was it 100 Philistine foreskins? Does anybody remember the story? Okay. That's like scalping the Indian times, right? Whenever you bring the scouts home. But how many was it? 400? 120. Something. It was a number. And he said, if you were, and, and he said, if you're gonna, Saul said he would give his daughter to be the to, to be the wife of the man that could do that and to kill and kill this Goliath. And maybe I'm mixing the two stories up, but nevertheless, whenever whenever David heard that, he said, what did, what did he say that he would give the man that killed this this giant? He said, I get his I get his daughter to be my wife. He said, I, basically he didn't say exactly like this. He said, I'll kill him for free. Because he said, let me tell you something. He said, why are y'all letting this uncircumcised Philistine speak to you this way? What, what he was implying, what he was saying is this, this thing that has you bound in fear is not in covenant with God. You are God's covenant people and, and you're shaking in fear and you don't understand that, that you have God on your side. You don't understand that God is here to fight your battles amen, and that he will give you the victory. And in those that are in covenant with God, I need you to know if you're in covenant with God tonight, you may not even understand exactly what that is. But if you've given your heart to Christ, it means you're in covenant with God. And Jesus has already defeated the powers of darkness. And he is going to fight your battles. Whatever your battles were. I looked at in my past. I had a whole bunch of mess all over my life. And even as a Christian for the longest time because I didn't know who I was in Christ. I need you to know tonight, you are a victorious warrior in Christ. You're more than a conqueror through him who loved you. He's already won the battle. You've got to learn how to believe that, my friend. You've got to learn how to believe that. Praise God. Amen. So it's important that whenever we begin to study this, that we realize God's thoughts on righteousness were introduced, but we haven't really been told what God really believes about righteousness. In the next chapter, he's going to be very clear. And let me just go ahead and say it right now in case you're not here next week. Righteousness has a name. His name is Jesus. God's righteousness is not you doing something tomorrow good when today you didn't do it good. God's righteousness is Jesus. He never fails. He never lets the Father down. And if you be found in Him, hallelujah, then now you've been clothed with the righteousness of God. And if you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ, man, God's grace can flow in you. God can change you. He can transform you. He will do a work in you. Amen. Amen. The perspective of this <laughs> chapter still focuses it focuses on the conscience of man and also on the law of God and how these two, both the conscience and the law, will prove to man, both Jew and Gentile, his guilt before God. And, and we'll get into that a little bit more. The, because you can't keep the law. And your conscience, even though you may feel like you made better decisions in your life than somebody else, that is not the standard of God's righteousness. God's righteousness is Jesus. And the quicker that we understand that, the less likely we will be self-righteous. And then we would be puffed up and we would look condescendingly down on other people. Amen. Jesus, look, Jesus said, I didn't come to, I didn't come for the wealth, folks. That's what the Pharisees were giving him a hard time. He said, I don't even come for the well people. I came for the sick. Yes. But, the, but this is the interesting thing. You can think for one second those Pharisees that were trying to kill him were well? No. This is, many times people don't even realize how bad they need Jesus. Yes. People in the church don't realize how bad they need Jesus. He said, I didn't come for people that think that they're okay. Mm -hmm. 
I came for those that know they're sick. And I don't know about you, but I know that I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But I know one thing. If He don't keep working on me and holding me up, Lord, help me. Because I ain't wanting to go back like the sister prophesied. Don't go back like a dog to your vomit. Come on. Come on, somebody. I don't know. Yeah, you get that. Yes, Lord, help us. So, internal righteousness is created in the heart by the hand of God. Other, until God creates internal righteousness by his hand, then really all we're doing is we're trying to make ourselves look good on the outside with our hands. Hence fig leaves in the garden, right? After the fall, they tried, it's like I'm, I'm naked and I'm, and I'm not doing good and trying to cover myself up. But that's, it's just an external work. So it's important for us to understand with this relationship about this internal aspect of man and that the place that that is the place where God dwells, just like he dwelled beyond the veil in the Holy of Holies. Now, when we accept Christ and it's important that you understand this when we accept this is my intro, but I, but I'm, I promise you, I'm not going to keep you. Now, whenever listen, whenever you give your life to Christ, the. The New Testament talks multiple times about the human body being a house. And, and the idea is that also the scripture says that you're the temple of God. Did you not know that you're the temple of God? Amen. And so when you truly get saved, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you. Just like he was beyond the veil in, in the Holy of Holies, he now lives on the inside of you. And, and I just put in my, in my notes, he's not coming to shack up. He's coming in as the holy husband. He's coming in as the holy husband. And I say holy because he's going to do it right. Everything that he does is right. Everything that he judges is right. Every correction he brings is right. Every time that he loves, every time he forgives, every time he pours out mercy, it's all right. Everything that he does is right. Whereas you and I, we expect our wives or whoever to submit to us when in reality we ain't always right. But nevertheless, God has word. Let us understand that. But he's not coming to shack up. He's coming in as the holy husband. And look, he knows the best arrangement of the furniture in the house. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Sometimes you're sitting over there. Maybe I should move the couch over here. Down to, no, the Lord, he's moving in. And he arranges the furniture that's in there the way he wants it to be. But a, a non-submissive bride will just, no, no, no. I want the, I want the furniture to stay here, right? Y'all understand what I'm trying to talk about? I'm using an illustration that we don't want to let him have his way. Many times after he's moved in, we still want to do it our way. And we're fighting against the holy husband that's moved in. And he's like, no, I'm going to move this couch over here. I'm going to move this thing in your life this way. But we fight against it. And next thing you know, we find ourselves stumbling and fumbling and falling all over the place. Y'all get where I'm going with that? He will move when he chooses, when he chooses, and his bride will either be submissive or she'll just keep stumbling and falling in. I'm talking to you from experience, my friend. Just to kind of talk about judgment a little bit, I just want to give you some of the words of Jesus. Jesus said this in John 5. He said, for the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. He says, for as the father has life in himself, so he has given to the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Look at this. Because he is the son of man. I've been preaching a little bit using Hebrews chapter 2 quite a bit. And in Hebrews chapter 2, it describes the fact that Jesus became our brother. Right? Y'all remember me talking about that? That the idea is, is that because the children, you and I, were partakers of flesh and blood, he became us. He became human. He, he didn't have sinful flesh, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And the scripture says that he had to become us and he had to clothe himself or tint himself in human flesh so that he could understand our infirmities. The word infirmity means weaknesses. So that he can understand the weaknesses of humanity. And because he did that and because he offered himself as a sacrifice, he now has become a faithful high priest because he understands what you're going through. 
I, I need you to know that he understands what you're going through, what you're feeling, what you're exposed to, the, 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 the frustrations that you feel in your spirit whenever you feel like things aren't going your way. And you need to understand he's a faithful high priest. But listen, he's all, because of that, he's also a faithful judge. He's the son of man. He was given a human heart, although it wasn't tainted with sin. He was given a human body by which, by the way, let me remind you, it was wounded for you. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was, he was ridiculed. He was mocked and he laid his life down for, for you and I to, to pay the price. He has a right to judge man. Not only that, he's the perfect judge for man. Jesus went on to say this. He said, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. I have not spoken on my own authority. It's my father's words that I have spoken unto you. I only, he said in other places, I only say what I hear my father say. And, and I, I love this scripture and it's really been ringing in my ears. At the end of this, John 12 and verse 50, he says, and I know that he, he says, he says, for I have not spoken on my own authority. The father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say, what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Ultimately, God's commandment that he, God the Father gave to Jesus will result in eternal life for people. I, I don't think that, I, don't think that I, I have the words to try to really describe the importance of this truth. I think that we're living in the midst of a church world that we're just taking so much for granted. Right? Right? We're just taking, oh, it's just, it's just so, Jesus is just so lovey-dovey, and everything's going to be okay, and it's all right, and yet he died so that we can have eternal life, and, and, and that we, we're taking, we're kind of treating the word of God as a common thing, the blood of Jesus as a common thing, and I want to tell you, that's a very sobering situation. We need to, we need to wake up. We need preachers. We need people to speak this to it. We need to get into the word of God, and we need to see what the word of God says. Amen. The word teaches us that that God judges the inside, not what things look like on the outside. Jesus, you remember, he talked about tombs and cups. He talked about he said, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. What is a whitewashed tomb? Well, the headstone and the top part, they make it look pretty with white paint. But on the inside, it's full of dead men's bones to the Jew that was unclean. He said, you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of filth. And so what I need you, what I'm trying to communicate to you tonight or out of the text is that when judgment comes, he's judging the internal aspect of the human heart. He's judging the motives by which we did things. He's judging the Paul. Paul said this, and this is in Romans 2. He said, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Paul said, there's coming a day when Jesus, when God is going to judge the secrets of the hearts of men according to my gospel. Now, I got to tell you that the, that the gospel that Paul preached was the gospel of Christ. But I need you to understand this, is that Paul brought commentary to the words of Jesus. And, 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 and Paul, whether he was the writer of Hebrews or not, I believe he was, but I can't prove it. But, but whoever wrote it, but Paul's, Paul does the same thing. The message that Paul preached pierces, pierces into the internal parts of the heart and, and deals with the heart. It's like somebody told me one time when I preached at the Franklin Church back when I used to be on the elder board over there. He like, and he was a preacher over there. He said the first two times you preached, it was like an x-ray machine on the heart. And, and you know, can I tell you that? Many times it makes us uncomfortable because we don't like that dream machine on our heart. Because it makes us come to the reality of what's in our heart. Amen. And But I got to tell you, that's a beautiful thing that you could feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Right. Because so many people, they live their lives in such a way that they suppress the truth and they no longer feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, there can be great joy in that. Because see, Peter said in Acts chapter 2 that there comes refreshing with repentance. The weight and the guilt and the burden is lifted off. 
<clears throat> and he will give us the grace and the strength that we need because Jesus already purchased it for us. Amen. And, and so praise God for that. Amen. So the word affects the heart and will judge the heart on the last day. Nothing will be hidden. The motives of men will be unveiled and laid before God. And it's important that we understand that. Thank you, Jesus. I like this. this I'm going I'm to stop on this with this. Moses, he, Jesus says this in John 7. He says, Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. I mean... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? We, we, we envision, we're, we're trying to be convinced, people are trying to convince us that Jesus was like this really, no, Jesus did not play, my friend. He came to tell the truth so that people would not be surprised, so that they would not be sorrowful. I was talking to somebody today and, 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 and they were like, Saying some of the same stuff I've been thinking about. Like on that day, there's no more reasoning with God. There's no more, there's no more, let's do a deal. No, the deal was supposed to be done on this side, if we can call it that. He says, he says, Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. Then the crowd says to him, you're demon possessed. He's trying to kill you. Jesus said, I did one miracle on the Sabbath. Remember that he healed the lame man by the pool of Bethesda and he said, pick up your bed and walk. And he said, I did one miracle on the Sabbath and you were amazed, but you work on the Sabbath too. He said, because see, if the circumcision day, I, this has a lot to do with circumcision, if the circumcision day falls off because it was the eighth day, eight days after the baby was born, they had to be circumcised. Jesus said, if the, if the circumcision day falls on the Sabbath, you, go, you, you circumcise him because why? Because you're keeping the law. He said, I made this man whole. That's right. and, and, and then he goes on to say this. He says, this is, the, this is another the NLT version. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Wow. Listen to me, church. Don't just because just because Pastor Matt stole his dad's car and ran away to L.A. when he was 15 and he don't do that no more. <laughs> just because he took his first hit of acid on a Greyhound bus coming back from L.A. and he don't do that no more. Just because of all this stuff, I can sit here and list off and he don't do that no more. That's external stuff. Praise God, man. You can't change the outside if you have to change on the inside. But sometimes we can make it look okay. Sometimes we can make, but what I'm trying to say is, is that he is going to judge the internal aspect. And we plead, Lord, help us. Amen. Help. And I want you to understand something too. There's freedom for us. I, I, what I need you to understand, you've maybe, maybe you're here tonight and you've never experienced that. You've never experienced, I'm talking about freedom even in your thoughts. I need you to understand in case for some reason I never see you again. I need you to understand that what Jesus did when he died on the cross will do such an internal work, not just to expose what's on the inside, but to heal what's on the inside. Yes, to the point where he will change the motives of your heart, but he will also change the thoughts in your mind. A supernatural work of the Holy Spirit where he changes the desires of your heart, changes the internal wiring of your brain because the scripture says you've already been given the mind of Christ, but that you and I must now allow our mind to be renewed and that our mind would line up with the truth of the word instead of continuing to allow uh, you know these things to continue on. And, and listen, I, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a journey. But it's a journey that must be taken in the Word of God. <clears throat> and if you're not allowing yourself to be exposed to the, to the truth of the Scriptures and allowing the living Word to come alive in you, you never are going to have the opportunity to, to experience that freedom that I speak of. And it's, that doesn't, it's not because one person is better than the other. No, it's all about Jesus. It's all about His finished work. But it does take, it, it's, a, it's a work of grace to give us the revelation. Amen. You know, there's some other scriptures. Jesus said, you know, why are you pronouncing judgment on your brother? Like, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't see the log in your own eye? Right? He says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, he says, uh, he says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 
Amen. And then, like I said it earlier, in Romans 2 and 29, he says, A Jew is one that's inward, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. You understand that? So it's the spirit of God, and I've said this a lot of times, wielding the scalpel that's doing surgery on the heart, but we have to let him have access there. And that means a long time with the Lord, too. Like, real business with the Lord, doing business with the Lord, amen? Let the Word of God have, have its way. So I want to I wanted at least try real quick to cover at least the concept of forbearance. So I said, what is forbearance? What is long-suffering? It's, it's describing the fact that God is being patient. And then I'm about to read, you can put Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 up. It says, it, and it also talks about the goodness of God. Okay, so in Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, I'm just going to read this to you. It says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness? You know what the word presume means? Presumptuous. It means you're taking something for granted. Are you taking something for granted? Are you taking for granted that your mom's going to cook you breakfast tomorrow? I'm just saying. Are you taking for granted that, you know, whatever? Okay. And, and, and the question is, are you taking for granted God's kindness and his forbearance and his patience with you? You get that? Not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. The King James Version uses the word goodness. Not knowing that God's goodness leads you to repentance. But then it says this in verse 5. But because, This is really where you get the context. But because of your hard... Now listen to me, church. <coughs> We're talking to people right now that don't have Jesus. So I want you to understand that if you have Jesus, we're not exactly talking to you, but we still need you to understand the condition of the human heart without Jesus. Amen? Okay. And, 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 and so he says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, now what I need you to understand is this. What do you, when you read that or when you go home and you read it later, like, how do you, what are you imagining in your mind and in your heart God's goodness looks like? Because I got to tell you, I've had conversations with people about this scripture. And many would believe that the goodness spoken of here, the kindness spoken of here, would be best described as a message from a preacher that is soft. And I'm not saying that you got to be loud to, to be effective. That's not what I'm saying. That just happens to be what I am. Sometimes I don't even like it. But what I'm saying is a message that's soft and filled with what their definition of love would look like. And the whole while they are saying that the reason that they don't want a message that they would label as hard or mean is because their own heart is sinful. Or they believe that people that are sinful in the world need to be treated with softly because it's God's goodness that leads a man to repentance. Y'all yeah, understand what I'm talking about? Y'all been there before? Y'all with me on this? And, I'm, and what we really need to do is we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Because there's times for softness and there's times, there's, there's times to be led all the time to be led by the Holy Ghost. But what I need you to understand is, is that what the context is this. God's goodness is the fact that he's long-suffering. Yes. God, amen? God's goodness is the fact that he's being patient with us. Yes. And, and that he's being patient with those that are out there. And he's waiting one more day like Peter says. God is long-suffering towards us because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the goodness of God that it's speaking of. It's not saying that when you tell the truth, that's me. No. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So I'm just going to close with this. Um, in verses 12 through 16, I'm going to just skip down and read verses 12 through 16. It says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. 
For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience, you see their conscience, we're talking about law and conscience. Remember I told you those two words earlier. It says that their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Okay, and he goes on to say, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? That we would all agree to taking money out of a cash register is stealing. But some people will, will, will cook the books on their taxes and they don't call that stealing. I'm just trying, I'm just saying. I'm just trying to use something as an example. We all know that committing adultery is a sin. But, but we don't remember what the Lord said whenever we lust yes. after a woman in our heart. You see, how are we going to get past that one? Only with the grace of the Holy Ghost changing our heart? Doing an internal work on the inside of us? We're, we're, we're at your mercy, Lord. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. Yeah. You know, God help us. But you know, shouldn't murder a person, right? But what about if you? But well, what about hate in your heart? Yeah. What about you're angry with your brother without proper cause, and all these other things that the Lord speaks of? Okay. And so I just want to really talk to you real quick because this is what he's. This is what he's saying. Because Gentiles have a conscience. Because we all have a conscience. That we can, in our heart, in our in our own mind, we can kind of see some good decisions based on bad decisions. I'm kind of just using this to describe it the way I feel like I'm going to describe it. Every human being has made choices that resulted in negativity for their own life. Right? Every human being has made choices that has resulted in negativity for their own life. Let me say that one more time. Every human being has made choices that resulted in negativity for their own life. And in a, in a logical, well-thinking human being would say, I'm not going to make that decision again because it affected me negatively. And it also maybe even affected my people around me. Right. And so and so based upon that conscience and how they felt, they might make a better decision the next time. Something that's good for society, something that's good for the people that are living around them. Like if you're living with a whole bunch of people and I was going to be good, my conscience, like whenever I see the towel that I left on the floor, I would pick it up. You understand what I'm trying to say? But just because your conscience sometimes tells you to do something right, that is not going to free you and make you make you innocent in the, in the eyes of God. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? And it's the same thing with the law. The law of God from time to time, a Jewish man sees what the law says and he and he does the right thing. But by but the, the word of God says this, but it's not the hearers of the law, but it's the doers of the law that are righteous before God. No man can keep the law in its fulfillment. That's why Jesus had to come. Amen. And to keep the law and to lay his life down as a sacrifice for sin. Amen. Praise God. God, Jesus had to come and lay his life down as a sacrifice for sin. And that it, and that what resulted from that is a circumcision of the heart. Amen. Praise God. And that's what he came to do with internal work. Singers, musicians, if y'all could come forward. Lord, we ask you tonight to circumcise our heart, Lord. Have your way with us, Lord.